Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to another episode. I hope you guys are doing amazing. This is going to be a late night talks, kind of like an advice form, Reddit mixed one, where I'm going to go through some of the comments that were left on my Instagram box and then some that were also that I thought would be fun to go through on Reddit. I honestly feel like one of the things that I have always heard from my listeners and that I always, you know, feel very, very grateful about is that people say that I cover a wide range of topics and I feel very, very happy about that because that is one of my goals and that's why I'm always open to different different topics even if it's not something that i've experienced or something that i don't know about directly because if i can't share something you can and i actually have like these question stickers that i sometimes do so it's like you know there's always an opportunity to share and help someone inshallah so i wanted to also take it on reddit and kind of look around on other advice forms and see what other people might be saying because there's only so many things that you know my listeners or my demographic that's on instagram could say or on discord can say so i wanted to kind of mix both and see, you know, where we end up. Now, for starters, I do want to say I do read y'all's DMs, and I know that a lot of people messaged me saying that I should upload longer episodes, and I've definitely been trying. I honestly thought that no one really kept up with what type of episodes I was uploading like that because I have like a hundred something episodes like there's always something to listen to but a lot of people actually messaged me saying that they are ran out of episodes and these small ones are just not cutting it no more and so I should record and I was like that is very sweet it makes me very happy to know people actually listen to me ramble for such a long time but you all know like as as big girl things are progressing in life it's just been a little bit hard to have time but I definitely am going to try my best to keep this going of course but yeah, just know that I do be reading it. And let's let's do our first one. I have not gone through IG yet. We're going to go through it together. The first one is a very, very nice one. And I think that I could share something on this one. Assalamu alaikum. Do you have any tips on what to do during Qiyam layl to avoid getting sleepy? Okay, this is beautiful. So, here's a few things that I'll say. A lot of times, I think the hajjud comes in our life as an invitation when things are going wrong, right? So when things are going um, wrong or something is happening to you, you really want something, the hajjud is kind of like that, you know, it's kind of like this invitation that brings you to the hajjud, it brings you forward to it, and then you start bringing the hajjud, and then, you know, you get the thing you want, or maybe you don't, or things work out in a better way, whatever it is. I feel like if you're someone who wants to put the hajjud in your life, you want to put night prayers in your life, like as a routine, as like a thing you want to do, then there's some things that I think I can share that can help with that. And these are just my opinions. These are things that have helped me. I'll tell you the first thing. I remember I one time heard this saying, okay? I'm not saying that it's all and be all, okay? But I'm saying that it's something that sat in my mind, okay? When I was, this was a couple of years ago, when I first wanted to make the hajjad a uh, common everyday part of my life right something i do every day i one time heard someone say that the days that they commit more sins they notice that they wouldn't wake up for the hajjad despite the fact that they would turn on their alarm despite the fact that they would make the intention it just wouldn't work right now that's that in my mind and that was something that i did test out a few times and it's I feel like, in my opinion, for the most part, yes. Now, here's the other thing. Does that mean that if you're a sinner, you can't wake up for the hajjit? Absolutely not, right? Like, this is a time, this is an invitation where you come, you can repent for your sins, you can ask for whatever you want. But I think that it's always very important to remember and honor that the night prayer is something that is not not something everyone's invited to, right? It's not something that everyone has done or has gotten the opportunity to do it. So if you have the opportunity to make this a frequent part of your life, first off, never ever boast or think that it's you. Because I can promise you it's so easy to just not wake up, to just get too sleepy, to just, you know, miss it. So first of all, be, be very, very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you are someone who's not had that capability, you've not had the chance to always wake up frequently, to have it a part of your teen, whatever it might be, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. As long as you're trying, alhamdulillah, that within that's a blessing, right? And I'll tell you that it sometimes takes on and off six months or maybe even a year to really get accustomed to it. For some people, it's shorter, three months. I think it depends. So a few factors I think go into making the hajjad a lifestyle part of your life, right? Not just how do I not get sleepy, but also how do we sustain it? So first thing, because this person did ask regarding, you know, sleepiness, I will always say I know that people don't like hearing this, but going to bed early really is the answer. I have been going to bed at 1030 for years. And if you listen to my podcast, you know that that's something I always talk about. I have went, I, I go to bed every day, 1030. Okay, 
I try my best not to slip off of that because what I notice is when I do slip off of that, I'm incredibly sleepy at the Hajjah time. I'm incredibly sleepy at Fajr time and it's just a mess. It's icky. It's it's gross. I'm just I'm not in the mood, okay? So first thing first, you're going to have to find that time. I know that in summers with Isha happening late, it's a little bit hard. So I think that definitely try to do your bedtime routine before Isha. Then the last thing you do is you pray Isha and you go to bed. Now, of course, the first few nights, maybe the first few weeks are obviously going to be hard if you have a habit of staying up, but adjust to it. You'll be fine. You'll change. Give it some time. It takes some time for your body's alarm clock to kind of switch around. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'll say is I one time heard this saying, and I don't know if I'd call it a saying. It's more of a concept. I think this is something that I also had to teach myself in some time in my life, and I'll tell it to you. It's kind of a lesson that I learned from night prayer. One of the things that night prayer taught me in my life is that having a good perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, answering your du'as and granting you what you want is an incredible thing. But do not ever just stop there. Because a lot of times, you know, things don't go our way. That doesn't mean that your tahajjah du'as fail. That doesn't mean that things, you know, are not working in your favor. Things can work in your favor in the future. Maybe they're working for you right now. I remember I knew somebody who went through a very, very traumatic marriage. And it was so it was so traumatic that I can't even put words to it. Um, eventually ended in a divorce. And when she came right back, she went to Umrah. Her and her family went to Umrah. And her family, you know, like, all parents had that thing like please please just like I don't want her to get divorced like you know you're holding on on edge but then you know when things get abusive you leave and you have to leave right and I remember after they came back from Umrah her mom always says that having my daughter leave him was one of the best decisions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever allowed in our lives okay so the thing is a lot of times you make dua for something things don't happen your way that doesn't mean you leave night prayer that doesn't mean you get mad at it. That doesn't mean you think, well, Allah doesn't even hear me. He's at the lowest heavens. He doesn't hear me. It's not about that. This is a far more greater picture. You waking up at a time when everyone else is asleep. One within itself is a beautiful invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to talk to Allah. Do not ever lose sight of who Allah is. Because sometimes our desires and what we want become so big that we only think about Allah when we think about those desires. So when people are like, I'm thinking good of Allah, I want him to give me this. When you create these contingent sentences and relationships, nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong thinking good of Allah. But one thing in my life that I feel like I've learned is that that is a beautiful phase. That is a beautiful way to think. And I think it is a beautiful thing to, you know, always keep good belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, that he'll give you what you want. But I also think that it's very important to keep good belief in Allah, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is good, because he has always done good, because he's always given you good. It's not just about right now. It's not just about what you want. It's not just about your dua getting answered or not. It's about the fact that one, he's woken you up at a time, which is such a beautiful time that not everyone gets an invitation to. Secondly, Things are going to happen that might not always be in your favor. That doesn't mean that you abandon this night prayer or you leave it. Gaining a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes is better than what you're even asking for. And I know that people hate hearing that because a lot of times you're so fixated on what you want. And I'll repeat myself that there's nothing wrong with keeping a good perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, wanting something and thinking like, okay, if I make dua about this, I keep firm faith, I keep firm hope, you know, I keep a good perception of Allah, Allah will give that to me. That's fine. But I also think that we have to sometimes... Get out of our lens that we have of our relationship with Allah on these things of what I want and what I don't want and how I want my life to go. Sometimes when you know Allah and you learn about Allah for who he is and what he's done for your life thus far and going forth, sometimes just loving Allah looks like loving him for him, loving him for all that he's done for us, not just limiting it to I want this from you so I'm going to think good of you. Now, of course, there's the hadith that talks about, you know, how Allah is as you think of him. And that's true. And that's exactly why you should never, in my opinion, just limit your perception of Allah to the thing that you want. Never. You never limit your perception of Allah to just the dua that you want it answered. Okay? And I know that some might disagree with me. But let's say someone is, you know, starting to gain a good perception of Allah because they want their dua answered. That's fine. That's fine. But let's remember that if your dua doesn't get answered, Allah is still good. You should still worship him. You should still wake up for night prayer. You should be still praying your fard. You should still have that relationship with him. Because at the core of it all, 
he still acted of good. He still gave you of good, did he not? You might think it's not good. And that's where all that, you know, emotions and perceptions and emotional turmoil comes in where I thought that was good. I didn't get what was good. Allah always acts in good, does he not? Every single thing has good. There's another one that talks about how anything and everything Allah does is good. Whatever befalls a Muslim is good. So at that core, you have to keep both of those concepts in mind. There's nothing wrong with keeping a good perception about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is as you think of him. But please do not ever just limit your beliefs of Allah based on, you know, this or that or what I want. Because Allah is so much more greater than that. He sustains you every day. Your ability to walk and breathe and go throughout this life is because of him. Never ever turn away from him because he did not give you what you want, quote, quote. Who knows? He could have given you something far better. And you are never going to know until he wants you to know. When life takes you to that point where you're going to know, you're going to know, right? But it's never worth turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you didn't get something in this life. Never worth it. I hope that kind of made sense. But that was something that I learned as well, which was a hard lesson I learned out of the Hajjad because I, like most people, started it because I wanted something. And when I didn't get what I wanted, which I'll tell you, there were quite there were quite a few things in my life that I wanted that I didn't get on and off for different years. I felt very devastated. And when I used to hear these hadiths and these different things and these stories of the Hajjad miracles and how Allah is at the lowest heavens, I was like, why don't why doesn't my dog get hurt? But then I felt like within these years I found something which has granted me comfort, which has granted me this, like this, I don't even want to say it, a numbness, but like it's granted me this sounded feeling that even if I don't get what I want, I feel so, I feel happy knowing that that's what Allah chose for me. Because there's a certain level of love and there's a certain level of trust and there's a certain level of just, you know, that relationship with God that he made me. He's taking care of me. Of course, he's going to want what's best for me. Like, and especially if you're waking up at the hajjad, you're trying your best, you're trying your hardest, you're making so much dua. And if things don't go your way, look at it with love. He's done this decision with love. Think of him with love as well. So that was one of the lessons on that. And I think that really strongly does shape, you know, people's consistencies at times with the hajjad. So the first thing, like I said, going to bed early. The second thing being this one that I just mentioned. And the third thing I think I will say is... Try your best to, of course, live in your day in a way that, you know, inshallah, you're going to wake up at the hajjah time. Try your best to not commit sins. Try your best to minimize sins. Try your best to, you know, be on the right path, do the right things, um, whatnot in the third. And, you know, if you slip up, it's not the end of the world. Always remember that the hajjah is a time where you can come and repent for your sins and whatnot in the third. Just keep that good, well-rounded intention through and through and try your best every night to wake up for it. You know, make dua to Allah every night for it. And inshallah, things should get better. I also think that, you know, the whole concept of feeling super sleepy during it, I think that that is also something that builds up over time. I feel like when you start to go to bed early, like for some time, I feel like for even me, like I felt like, you know, a solid three, four months, like I just felt really sleepy. Like even now, sometimes I do. But I feel like when you build on that with consistency over time, your body does adjust to knowing that, okay, 30 minutes around this time, I'm going to wake up. And so sometimes it, it gets better. My whole thing would be just remain consistent. Okay, next one. This one's very beautiful. How to be supportive in someone's happy moments when you are struggling. That That's incredible. You know, I think that a lot of times this is something people don't ask, but I think that this is something that we should learn how to do and should learn how to maintain within our relationships. I was actually having a conversation with my friend about this yesterday. So I'll tell you some things that I think that are important. One of the things that I think make it really easy to be involved and happy in someone else's happiness even when you are struggling is sometimes zooming out on what you're going through and putting yourself in the fact that this is someone who worked really hard for something and they're now getting it right and I'm not saying to minimize your struggles or to completely ignore for the rest of your life because you just want to be happy for others but I'll tell you for a fact like let's say for example I remember one time I was struggling and I was just having like you know down bad moments and my one of my closest friends she was like on cloud nine, like she was doing so, so good. Like she got a new job. She was being super successful. And, you know, she was just handling herself great. And I felt really happy for her. And I still tell her that like I'm, I'm, I was happy for her because no matter what I'm going through, these are people that are part of my life. And I want these people to succeed. It doesn't matter if I'm having a down moment or a bad moment or if I'm succeeding or vice versa. Like you have to remember that, you know, in these moments, try your best to show up for them. Congratulate them. Say, you know, I'm so proud of you, da, 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 whatever. Show up to their events. Like do these things that make them feel loved, even if it's a little bit hard on yourself. 
I'm not saying, again, to completely ignore the way you feel and never pay attention to it and just drown yourself in other people's celebrations. All I'm saying is that sometimes, especially for the people closest to you, showing up means a lot. Like sometimes you don't even have to do anything. Just showing up means a lot. And I think that that's important. I will always keep the belief that you can have everything, but not just all at once. And when you are someone who you know, might be work the job or you're getting like a really competitive education or you're busy in a lot of different things, you know, like you or you want to start a family while you're in school. Like there's so many different things. You know, you can have everything. You just can't have it all at once. So maybe even you can have, you know, an education going for you, getting married, starting a family. But you also have to understand that at different points, you won't always 100 percent, you know, be the best mom, be the best wife, be the best student. Like you can have everything but not all at once you can physically have them have those things but doesn't mean you'll always be present in each and every single one of them you know a hundred percent and this is one of those things i'll tell you one thing as i was mentioning earlier i was talking to my friend about the fact that we have coined this term right i think this whole generation has coined this term called you know um what is it a low maintenance friend right like a low maintenance friend a friend that you don't really have to keep up with like that you know how they say low maintenance friend? I would say, like, for example, I think I'm a low maintenance friend. Okay. That's my opinion. I think I'm a low maintenance friend. And that's something that all my friends have ever told me in my life that I'm a low maintenance friend. Because I personally, I'm not the type that I'm not going to get mad or lashed out. Like, if he texts me back late or if we don't, sometimes, like, even with some friends, like, y'all won't talk for weeks. And that's because crap be going on, bro. Like, not everyone can always talk, you know? And, like, I'm not the type who, like, gets upset over those things at all. Right. But one of the things that I feel like I've started to peep now that I'm getting a little bit more vigilant about these things, vigilant about my circle, closer and, you know, more more mindful about who I'm around, is that there's a very big difference between a low-maintenance friend and an absent friend. And a lot of people don't like to talk about that, but the reality is a low-maintenance friend is a friend that doesn't require, you know, you to do so much for them, you to show up for them 24-7 like that. They're okay with you occasionally checking in, they're okay with you, you know, being around, whatever it is, like when hard times come, you're there. Obviously, you might not be the friend that's there 24-7 to always accommodate, but you're there when need be. An absent friend's not there at all. And I feel like a lot of us have absent friends that we call low-maintenance friends and justify it and say that we're okay with it, when in reality, they're absent friends. Now, I personally don't like to fall into the realm of all this stuff because I feel like, to some degree, it's a little bit childish. Like, I, you really can't make someone show up or not show up. You can't make someone do something or not do something. Like, I'll tell you, for example, theoretically. Well, I don't know if theoretically is even the right word, but a couple months ago, my mom got really, 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 really sick. And it was like weeks upon weeks, she was ending up in the hospital. And so first, she ended up because she was having some heart problems. And the second time around, it was like a week later and it was like at 3 a.m. Something else had happened. It was a really hard time. Like, oh my God, I, I remember the second time around, I went to the hospital and I sat there from 3 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. That time was a rough time. Let me tell you that cold, hard seat. I brushed my teeth in the hospital bathroom. We're not going to talk about that day. That day was, I, I had Crocs on. And you know, if you know anything about me, I'm not a Crocs girly, but I was just out bad, bro. That day was not a good day, okay? That day was not a pleasant day. But what that time did teach me those couple months where she was really sick was who was there for me and who wasn't who was just generally showing up and being like hey i know that you're going through a lot like you know how how are you or even just like hey i hope you're okay like a dry like i'll take the dry like hey are you okay like you know just knowing that like oh i've thought about you i know what you're going through like a little acknowledgement and i feel like that is really what it means to show up for people at times even when you have the hardest emotional capacity i know that people say say showing up is really different like you know doing grand gestures coming to your house always helping and that's not always possible for people right like especially as you're growing up everyone is busy but i also know what type of friend i am and like i'm the type of person that will always always text and even if it's a small one, like, hey, I heard what you're going through. I hope you're okay. Or, hey, I heard about your loss. You know, if there's anything that I can do for you. Or even like on Eid, bro, like, I'll always try my best to be the one who always reaches out to people, always sends them a message, letting them know that I'm there for them, or randomly checking in, acknowledging them. And I only have a handful of people that do that for me. And the reality is that teaches you something. Because girls get it, probably guys don't, because guys are just no 
like y'all don't even talk for like six months and it, i mean guys are just weird like let it go switch the subject from there girls get it that like for a sustained relationship like good friendships like and when you have a good tight friendship with a girl like y- you know y'all talk y'all talk even if it's once a week like you know it's there's a difference between low maintenance and not showing up at all and that's my point and so you know it might be hard when you're struggling but i think it's important to just try your best even if it's in the smallest things just being like hey i'm so happy for you congratulations I- i'm happy for what you're going through little things just remind people that you're in their corner and that you're there with them when they're succeeding i know that it's not possible to always do grand gestures and it's not always reasonable either like when you're going through so much crap you cannot sit there doing grand gestures for someone else to congratulate them in a perfect world maybe you could but this is not a perfect world and you cannot always 100 percent show up so at least acknowledge it at least and i think that that i think if you have a friend who's very understanding would also get that like me and my friend have had a lot of times where you know in moments of celebration of one another, maybe we weren't able to do the 100% best. But she knows that I'm always proud of her, and I know that she's always proud of me. And so there were times when we were able to 100% show up at our best, and there were times that we weren't. But either way, there was a constant pattern of always having that person in the scene of your life. And I think that's what matters, being in the scene of someone's life. Okay, we're switching gears to Reddit now. And some of these are very serious, some of them are light. This one says, I told my work my grandma died. When she didn't, what do I do? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> hey, Joe, I'm not doing that. Let's look at the next one. Backup person. Okay. I don't know if this is the right place to say it or not, but I feel like it also applies to friendships, not solely romantic relationships. Why do some people have backup people in their lives? They aren't completely disinterested, but not exactly enthusiastic about them, but still keep the relationship alive at the back of their head. They know it's not. One, why are they doing it? Two, what can this say about their personality? Oh, that's lore right there. That's lore. Here's what I'll say about this one on a general note. Never ever deal with somebody who has a backup plan in their mind. I knew someone who was severely, severely, severely in love with a certain person and it didn't work out and now they look for that person in every single individual they meet y'all know that saying how it's like oh men love once and then they look for that girl and every single girl they meet kind of like that and that person is trying to get married again but they can't because they're like no girls like her And the problem is, this is not just one situation. Like, this is something we all know. Like, there's always so many people out there that have romanticized their heartbreak to a point that they can't get over it. Not saying that to be mean. It's just the truth. Don't romanticize pain. Don't romanticize a heartbreak. Don't romanticize the idea of not having someone that you want. Like, there's some things that you got to be like, damn, that ain't work out. And, like, forget about it. Like, move on. And even in a friendship, like, don't deal with these back people you know these people that always have something else in their mind i feel like one of the greatest signs of commitment and loyalty is coming all in without something in the back of your mind without having an escape route right because how loyal would i be if i was saying to you i was loyal but i always had something in the back of my mind and a way to escape that's not loyalty right and that's that's just what it comes down to i think so i think that it's never worth dealing with people at that point blank period even if you think that oh you know they won't actually go back or they don't have that person in their mind I'm telling you that people keep backup options or backup people in their lives alive and the opportunity alive for a reason. And that it's because they haven't healed from it and they have not moved on from it. But they're with you because they've also acknowledged the fact that they probably can never get with that person that they've made their backup person. That's just it. That's what it says about their personality too. People keep these backup options in their life because they hope that one day whoever their backup option is will agree or want to be with them again and then they will dip you and run away that's just that like that's not me being a negative nancy that's just the truth when you are ready to come into something wholeheartedly healed and with loyalty you don't keep backup options in your brain and if you have backup options don't mess with people that's it like it's it's literally that simple don't mess with people don't be a crappy human being who's trying to look for something to fill that void within them because they couldn't have what they want that's not a them problem that's a you problem that's it next one career versus relationship hi i'm a 22 year old uni student writing here to get this thing off my chest because it's driving me crazy over the past couple of years i've prioritized my academic career over relationships i'm kind of a perfectionist to achieve my goals and i felt it was necessary to dedicate all my efforts i reached a point where the work is getting harder and harder and it also feels harder to keep going like this i've turned down many people 
And recently, it's there's been another one that's been the straw that broke the camel's back. I feel frustrated. It's made me lose motivation. It's diminishing my productivity. I'm aware it's not healthy to suppress the needs for a relationship and socialization, but it's hard to let habits go. I'm afraid I might regret it. Okay, I'm summarizing that one because it's a little bit longer. Okay, I'll tell you something I learned in life about this one. I remember when I had all the time in the world for just people. That was a long time ago. I don't anymore, right? <laughs> and I remember the time when I really started to get more busy with life, okay? One of the biggest mistakes I made was that I didn't make time for people. And I constantly thought that I have to achieve my goals. I have to lock myself up in my room. I have to hustle. I have to do what I got to do. I have to go to work. I have to do these things. I don't have time for people because, you know, as they say, the grind is more important, as they say. You know what I learned is that, y'all know that, that quote that's like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's kind of that. That's one of the things I've learned in life. You can achieve whatever you want in life. You can achieve those goals and you're more likely to achieve them and do better when you're with people. The difference between my level of success from when I was just alone and the difference of success that I have found being with people has very much changed. I feel like being with people has helped me become a more well-rounded person in different aspects of my life. It has taught me management. It's taught me how to, you know, clear my head from just that. And I think that especially as a Muslim, you know, achieving worldly success, of course, you know, having good income, being wealthy, whatever, like it's nice, you know, it's important, but you never want to forget the fact that there are certain relationships that have rights over you and you have rights over them. And you cannot shut your entire life for the next, you know, four or five years when you just want to work hard to people. That's not how it works. Anyone who wants to be successful knows that you have to keep a good balance between the love and the relationships in your life and your hustle and what you got to do. That's just that. And you have to learn to keep that balance because too much of anything will make you ruined honestly it'll ruin you you get too involved with people and their problems and their consequences and love and drama and nah, 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 nah. and then that just becomes your whole life it becomes very small and you're constantly contingent on people their emotions it's too much and then when you get too consumed and just hustling and thinking that your entire life is about achieving success and goal and financial freedom you start to close off your own capabilities of also being emotionally available. You start to just constantly feel like there's nothing more important in life than what you got ahead of you. But there's plenty of more important things in life, you know, getting married, having kids, like that's important. And anyone who really wants success understands that growing in those fields of your life also grants you success in whatever it might be that you're trying to achieve. The more healthier you are, the more you're able to pour into other situations, the more you're able to pour into your work, into whatever you're trying to create, the better you'll be. But if you are burnt out, tired, exhausted, feeling, you know, like you have never had, you know, any time for yourself, emotionally unavailable, constantly you have to tie up your heart, like you're not going to go far. And quite often you turn bitter, you turn bitter, things annoy you, little things start to irritate you. And I'll tell you, for example, like when I was more focused on just trying to become successful at like an academic or like job level, you can say, I found myself to become more irritable. And it wasn't until years later that I started to open up my circle more, open up my own life more by just making time to be with friends. Because I think that's also a productive thing. Making time to be with people, making time to feel your emotions, making time to feel, you know, different things grants you more success in life than just locking yourself up and not feeling anything does. You will honestly get more irritable. It'll be harder to go on and you might be able to put, you know, good effort forth. But then at some point, no matter what you get, whether it's what you're even chasing, you might not feel happiness because you'll start to question what was the purpose of it all in the first place. And that's why it's really important to be very, very level-headed, especially like if you're someone that wants to start their own business or wants to do like their own things. Like, Having a business is not 9 to 5, it's 24-7, right? And so you're going to have to learn how to manage that. You're going to have to learn how to make time to be with friends, to be with family, to do those things because those things are productive. Those things are also productive in your output in that business, in your success, whatever it might be. You are going to go a lot farther when you have people with you. It is better to do sustained, small, medium steps every single day than to dump a lot at once and then feel burnt out. You're going to do a lot better. You're going to be happier and you're going to feel more well-rounded. And that's something that people can teach you. 
That's something being around different people, around different situations can teach you. That's something trying new things can teach you. We are all at some point or another right now, most likely anyone who's listening, because I've seen my demographic, probably in school, probably in college, probably in uni, probably maybe you're working a job, like probably busy, right? And you're probably trying to achieve things, probably trying to excel more. You're all probably at that phase of trying to, you know, build your success now so you can retire early, so you can be successful, so you can be financially free, whatever. Like everyone is kind of at that age in my demographic that I've seen. Everyone is kind of at that standpoint, right? And that's great. Elama Barik, Mela Grant, all of y'all success. I mean, but the point is, part of success is also being successful in your relationships and having good people around you at least that's how i see it that's something my mom has taught me as well my mom always says to me that success is not just what you get in your career or you know in your job or whatever success is also in your relationships and having good people around you and maintaining good relationships there's a success that lies in that and i think that being with people teaches you these invaluable lessons that you could not have learned being shut in your room staring at your computer screen all day you know trying to become a millionaire like you learn something from everybody and those things can help you and push you forward so i think that it's always very very much worth it never coop yourself up in your room trying to think that that's where success is going to breed obviously you know a good portion of it does lie in hard work no one's denying that but you've got to give yourself the window to breathe the window to be happy even if it's a passion project which a lot of people are not ready to talk about but you ain't hear it here but anyway mm. i hope this episode was in some way beneficial that's all i'm gonna cover for this one inshallah i'll try to film another one soon i hope this was beneficial in some way please take care of yourself have a great rest of your day assalamualaikum